And the verses Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn there. Yes, I have his son Yota Das the Hink. Do you have it? You want it? Okay. For thus says the high and exalted one, who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Wanor anun es surpen, yes partzer usurp de gepenagim, pats godrat u honar hokim net sovin heden, or besi honar nerun hokim yet tanatsmen, yet godrat sadera abretsmen. Now our title for this message is Our Thoughts Should Be a Sanctuary. I saw van Rita with the goche, mer horur nera get the land sepharag. follow along, it will make sense at the end. A sanctuary, let's start there. What's a sanctuary? Sanctuaries were in the Old Testament, in the, uh, when they had the tabernacle, when the Holy of Holies was. In the New Testament application, a sanctuary is where we are here right now. If you think about the word meaning that's being tossed around today in the news, you might hear the word sanctuary city. The idea behind that is where the illegals can be in a city or a state and still feel safe. The, the idea of sanctuary started in the Old Testament for us. That's where God was. The place was holy. Today, God is not separate from the believers. Jesus came, and because of his sacrifice and our faith in him, in that sacrifice, our repentance, are changing our life gave us the Holy Spirit. I saw or men kavrink Jesus yega mezi hamar men mekheru namar zovetsav men or pergebing ink uda mezi sur pokin. And that makes our body a holy place. Yet men marminere betarnat sur derma sur pavarma. Within this holy place. There needs to be the Holy of Holies. And that, I tell you, is our thoughts. Are you following me? Think of your life as a building. It needs to have a solid foundation. It needs to be built on the rock. Solid. And, 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 and Jesus put it as anyone who builds a house on the rock will stand, right? And he said, I am the rock. Right. And that rock is our theology, our doctrine, what we believe. And 
The structure that you build on it is your life. What you do on top of that foundation. And uh, we're going to skip the, the New Testament here. And remember a few weeks back we spoke about service and God challenging us. Take heart how you build on that foundation. Do you remember that? With hay, stubble, dirt, or was it gold, silver, and precious stone? You see, all of scripture is one continuous big story. There is a thread that goes all the way through, from beginning to end. And coming back to that building, your thoughts are its steeple, let's call it. You can control your thoughts. How many agree with me? Are you a victim of your thoughts or you're in control of it? You are not a victim. You are not a victim. Sometimes, right? A. W. Tozer had a great analogy I want to share with you. He likened the um, thoughts in two ways. One, he said, your thoughts could be like a raven who flies over the carcasses of your life. Over your and lands there and feeds on the carcass. That could be us being victim to our thoughts. We all have stuff in our past or in the present that we know is not from God. We might allow the raven of our thoughts go back and eat on the feast on that flesh. The untruths, the lies we believe, the, uh, the, the, the mistreatments that we, we keep going back to in our minds, the stuff that we, we just fall prey to by allowing our thoughts to go there. And if that raven goes and starts feeding on it, you're just going to get death from that. Coming back to Tozer's analogy, he said, there is another kind which is better. You, you can have your thoughts fly over like the dove and come back without lending on anything to the sanctuary of God coming back to the ark. The picture is in Noah's ark, you know, the, the, he let go of a dove and he flew and came back because there was nowhere to land. So coming back to our verse, thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. Now let's talk about some attributes of God. What are some of his attributes? He is, tell me, anything. Omnipotent. That means he can do anything. What else is he? Omnipresent. He is 
everywhere. Remember the uh, prayer of King Solomon when he built this beautiful, humongous building, the temple, with all its ornate gold and work. And he said, knowing fully well that, Lord, will you, will God live on earth? Even the heavens of heavens cannot contain you, let alone this house I built. So God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. What else is he? We have omnipotent, omnipresent, Somebody said omniscient, I heard. He knows everything. He knows what happened in the past. He knows what's happening right now. He knows what will happen million years from now. He knows what's going to happen to you. He knows what's going to happen to your children. He knows what's going to happen if you make that decision. He knows what would have happened if you had made other decisions to infinity. He knows everything. What else is he? He knows everything, yes, that, that's a part of that. He's, he's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Filled with compassion, mercy, and love. He is the highest form of love that we cannot even begin to understand and we can definitely not achieve. <laughs> And he's totally other. He's different than us. Thank God for that. <laughs> In a nutshell, this is some of God's attributes. So this God, this God that we cannot really truly comprehend, that cannot fit in the heavens of heavens, says that I will also live with the contrite and lowly of spirit. So he is over there. He's everywhere. But he is also with certain people. He's not with everybody. He is not with everybody that calls himself a Christian. He is not with everybody that was baptized. He is with a certain group of people. And that certain group, if you want to belong to it, starts with, what's the verse say? Contrite. Starts with contrition. What's contrition? No, contrition. Oh. Contrition. Contrite. Simpler way of saying, I'm sorry. Asking for forgiveness. What, what are you sorry about? What's this contrite, this contrition? about. What are we supposed to feel contrite about? I'm making it easy for you guys. Come on. Yes. Our sin. Do you want to belong to this group of people in whom this great God lives, you start with contrition. 
It's not in your genes. It's not a bloodline. You're not born into Christianity. You are not born into being saved. You're not saved because you're Armenian. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're saved in spite of your Armenianness. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that journey starts with the act of contrition. <laughs> Understanding <laughs> that, you know what, this holy, pure God against whom I have sinned. <laughs> And I cannot be in his presence. Small sin, big sin, does it, does it matter? I can't be in his presence. Can a little piece of darkness survive against a very powerful light? It's not possible. Our sin, no matter how great or little, is darkness. God is unending, pure, strong light. Two cannot coexist. It's not possible. That's why Jesus had to come. So to take away this darkness from within us. So to, when we stand in front of that light one day, Jesus will just stand up as our advocate and stand in front of us, which is darkness. So God would only see his light and not my darkness. This group starts with this contrition, understanding that I'm a sinner. And humility. I'm reminded of the verse that speaks of Nebuchadnezzar. Most of you guys know the story. He was a very rich, powerful, very uh, successful king. He conquered a lot of the known world back then. And he had this great construction projects. He built cities, dams, gardens, palaces, you name it. And he went out onto his balcony one day. It was a beautiful day, I'm sure. And he looked at that city. He was so prideful. He said, isn't this the great Babylon I have built? You guys know what happened next? God said, you think you built this? Okay, you think you made this kingdom? He said, okay, let me take it away from you just to teach you who built it. He said, because of your pride, you will lose your kingdom. Until you understand it is I who gave this to you. You guys know the story. Short while later, he's overthrown. He loses his mind and he lives like an animal on the field eating grass. Okay. 
And the scripture says his nails were long. He just became like his field animal. Until later on, in his words, Nebuchadnezzar says, until my sanity returned to me and I understood that it was him, not me. Only that act of contrition that restored him to his kingdom. Coming back to our verse. God who lives up high, he is also in these fragile bodies of ours. He is present within us. But my point today, I want it to be, that place in our mind, our thoughts, need to be a holy place. It should be a sanctuary for us. Where we can meet with God. Where our minds are pure. They are not dulled with pride, unforgiveness, anger, lust. You fill in the blank. There's, 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 there's so much. It needs to be a pure and holy place where we can meet with God where we are not ashamed to stand before him. Where it's constantly being cleaned by confession and repentance. And being kept by the presence of the Holy Spirit. It should be where we go to for solace. I started by saying we can control our thoughts. In the Second Corinthians, um, we are told to make every thought captive to Jesus Christ. How do we do that? How do we do that? What does that mean to you? It starts with being spiritually aware of what's happening. Somebody put it this way. What you're thinking about when you have nothing to think about. <laughs> Pay attention to that. What are you thinking about most of... What did you think about in the last week the most? Where did your uh, mental energies go? Was it the raven that went back to the carcass? Was it the dove that just flew around and came back to the sanctuary? You can choose. You can decide to make those thoughts that are going to the carcass captive to Jesus. When you know you're headed towards that, that thought that takes you to fear, discouragement, anxiety, yeah. <laughs> when you see that happening, God's giving you the power to say, no, stop. That's when you take that thought, make it captive to Jesus. How do you do that? You were aware 
you realize you were headed for the carcass. A bad experience, a bad memory, fear, or whatever. You're headed there. How do you make it captive to Jesus? You remember his promises. You say it out loud to yourself. At least out loud in your mind. But remind yourself of God's promises. That's how you make every thought captive to Jesus. And then the rest of the verse has a promise. Why is this great and mighty God who's everywhere and knows everything and can do anything and knows everything? Choosing to be with the lowly, the discouraged, the, the contrite person? To revive them. To revive their spirit. To give you the energy, the focus you need. The help you need. I want to leave you with this today. Our thought life need to be clean, pure, and holy. Our thoughts should be a place where we can meet with God and feel secure and confident there. Any time your mind wanders to the dead carcass. And let me tell you, in some of our lives there are many carcasses. There are many things we had to deal with or we dealt with in our past and in our present. It's, it's all around us. Anytime you realize that your raven is heading that way, clean it. Lord, like Pat said, he gives it to the Lord. He takes a step, he prays, he says, Lord, this is too much for me, you handle it. God, God will handle it until the next one. There is going to be another one, I guarantee you. And especially if you become aware of this now and you're going to try it, you have an enemy who's trying to discourage you to do that. I want you to know you will be bombarded. Initially, you will be bombarded with a bunch of thoughts. But like the scripture says, we are not ignorant of his devices. We know what the answer is. You don't fall in for it, you continue praying, you continue speaking God's promises, it will go away. So keep your mind, your thoughts as a sanctuary where that God can come and meet with you. Where you're safe from fear, from anxieties, from discouragement, from worries of the future, of family, or finances, or health, whatever it is. Keep it pure. Amen? Amen.